Hello everyone, good evening, my name is Nathan. Three years ago, three and a half years ago, um, I landed in London. I left Hong Kong, the place where I love, I work hard for, and I devoted my life to fight for. Remember, on the last night I dined with my family, uh, with my mother. I couldn't tell her that I was leaving because by the fact that knowing me leaving, it could be a crime for her to be incarcerated. So that was a particularly painful dinner that I had with her. I couldn't tell her I was about to leave. Two days later, I, I, I had my hand carriage, hand carry luggage and my backpack, and I went to Hong Kong International Airport. I was really afraid because I didn't know whether I could board the plane. Maybe they had already put my name on a blacklist. Maybe the airline staff was already informed about my leaving. But I was very lucky. I managed to go through the custom, I boarded the plane, and I locked back to Hong Kong, the gorgeous nightscape of Hong Kong. And I know that I would never forget that scene. That was the last time I was in Hong Kong. After that, I was trapped outside um, in the UK, now as international advocate for democracy for Hong Kong, and also a refugee in this country. And for the past three and a half years, it's been really fruitful, but it's never like living at your home. I haven't seen my family for more than three years, and I'm still trying to pave my way home in the future when Hong Kong is free and democratic again. I would suspect that after these three years, when I go back to Hong Kong, I found a lot of things become strange. Maybe I cannot recognize the city anymore because it's getting so much suppressed. People don't dare not to talk about politics. People don't get engaged. The civil society vanished. And probably when I go back, I couldn't recognize the city anymore. I'm about to play I'm about to play a song which I think is unplayable, but um, this is one of the protest songs that was massively used in 2019 protest, which uh, you may have seen on TV where there were a lot of people protesting on the street or like petrol bomb flying over the, the, the cosmopolitan area of Hong Kong. In today's Hong Kong, when you play that song, you get arrested. Um, there's been case massively reported that a man uploaded a song and replaced it with the national anthem of China when there was a Hong Kong athlete getting a medal in a competition and he was arrested and he was awaiting for sentencing. Just by playing a song, you could get yourself arrested in today's Hong Kong. You can see the flag about free Hong Kong revolution now. It was a flag massively adopted in the Hong Kong 2019 protest. Guess what would happen if you fly it in Hong Kong? You get arrested. Um, there was a man being arrested uh, for the suspicion of sedition just by hanging that flat outside his apartment. In every country, we've got primaries. Uh, we are having an election coming next year, probably in this country. And in Hong Kong, because of there was a primary election, 47 people got arrested for participating and organizing that. Uh, many of them are my friends, and they've spent time in jail for more than two and a half years without knowing where, where they could get out. And the only crime for them was to be involved in a primary election, because the government says that if you are involved in a primary election that wants majority in the legislature, you are subverting state power. So that was the people who were merely exercising the rights that you innately have, and then still spending time in jail after two and a half years. My friend Joshua is still there. I don't know when he could get out. One of the latest reports coming out by a think tank, Hong Democracy Council, says that there are more than 1,000 political prisoners in Hong Kong. The figure is staggering. It is more than many of the ten countries that you can name now. And that is the stock situation of Hong Kong. Hong Kong used to be described as the Pearl of Orient. It, it was one of the freest cities in Asia. I heard a lot of good things about Hong Kong, and I bet you also did. How come Hong Kong ended up 
like this. A massive police state, massive incarceration, zero political freedom and civil society. How Hong Kong ended up like this? It will probably start with history. Well, um, it also starts with my history. Uh, I was born in mainland China. I was born in a bordering city called Shenzhen. Um, I was born in 1993, so I'm already in my 30s. Um, as you can see, um, different from all the stereotype of Asian students that you can imagine, I, I was not particularly good at math. I couldn't play piano when I was one or two or three. I, actually, I, can't, I still can't play piano now. And uh, probably one of my signature traits was eating McDonald's. So I think that was what I was good at. I was born in mainland China, and then at the age of six, I moved to Hong Kong. I moved to Hong Kong to reunion with my family, where my father was already working in Hong Kong as a construction worker. That's the story of me coming to Hong Kong. And my father's one is much more dramatic. When he was in his 20s, in the 70s, in mainland China, there were no food. There was a big famine in his village. And everyone knew that the only hope of survival is going to Hong Kong. So he managed to talk about raft roads, just something similar to the picture that's being shown. He took a three-day trip with the raft boat and the cell made by his back sheet at home and a small cans of peanuts within. And he sailed through the trains. It was a particularly tumultuous and dangerous route. He saw many floating bodies on the open sea just like many other who fled their countries because of war, because of economic and political reasons. But he was lucky. He managed to go through that trip, and then he went to the city center of Hong Kong, where there was a policy when you arrive at the city center, you are granted citizenship. It was a generous policy that later was abolished. But nonetheless, my father had reached Hong Kong. He told me, on the first day, he worked as a construction worker in Hong Kong. He earned more than a year of salary working in mainland China. So that was the stark difference for him. And for him, and for many others, probably millions of Chinese people who fled political economic turmoil, and they arrived in Hong Kong. Hong Kong was their refuge. Hong Kong was their home and their hope. Eventually, it was a time at late 70s when my father came to Hong Kong. Um, Hong Kong has a history of being colonized by the British government. Uh, it has been, it had been uh, colonized for more than 150 years. And by the time of 1980s, the British government had a negotiation with the Chinese government of handing back Hong Kong to mainland China. There was a transfer of sovereignty in 1997. But then Hong Kong people was really, really nervous because uh, by then, Hong Kong and China, they had a completely different system. As I said, Hong Kong was much more wealth. Um, there were more opportunity. They were open to the world. They were much more international. On the other hand, China back then was still really, really poor. They had really restrictive and repressive regime. And just not long ago, they had a decade or two political turmoil that lead to 20 or 30 millions of people dying unnaturally. So that was a stark difference, and Hong Kong people were so worried because they thought that if I were to return to mainland China's sovereignty and I'm being governed by them, what would Hong Kong be? And that was a big worry and anxiety of Hong Kong people back then. So you could put yourself into the shoe. If you face these kind of uncertainties, what would people do? Many Hong Kong people immigrated. They moved out of Hong Kong. There were three to four ways of Hong Kong people Hundreds of thousands of them have relocated to the UK and to Canada. And that was the amount of fear that Hong Kong had when they were about of being transferred back to mainland China. In the last decades of the colonial ruling of Hong Kong, it contradicts to many people's beliefs. Uh, many Hong Kong people saw that as the best time of Hong Kong because even though they were under colonial ruling, but the case of colony in Hong Kong was a bit different from the others. There were no massive butcher or massive killings back then. Uh, the British government had worked with local elites to try to govern the, the city. So uh, a lot of Hong Kong people benefited from this system. Um, and that is a 
totally abnormality in the history of colonialism of the British history. But that was what Hong Kong people thought. Um, and they were so worried about going back to the ruling of uh, the Chinese government and they would all lose all this prosperity and the economic vibrancy of Hong Kong. Um, as you can see, uh, in this picture, there was, uh, uh, by the time, Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher and also the Chinese leader Zhao Ziyang. They have signed a treaty uh, in order to tackle Hong Kong people's anxiety. In that treaty, that's called the British Strong Declaration, it says that Hong Kong people, after their transfer of sovereignty, they can enjoy freedom, um, autonomy, and gradual process to democracy. So Hong Kong people were very anxious. And in order to tackle that, Beijing gave Hong Kong people these promises. They tried to convince Hong Kong people, look, I know you are doing well now. And after the transfer of sovereignty, it was just one flat up, one flat down. We won't touch you. And that's called one country, two system. The main China and Hong Kong, they have two separate systems. And Hong Kong people retain their autonomy, freedom, and democracy. And that was the promise that Beijing gave Hong Kong people. And it was tabled in a treaty in the United Nations that has power overseeing um, the governance of Hong Kong after 1997, where the handover took place. But it was not that useful. The anxiety of Hong Kong people lingered, especially after the Tiananmen massacre taking place in 1989. In 1989, there was a big democratic movement taking place in mainland China. Millions of pizza workers Factory workers, students marched down to the streets asking for democratic reform, asking for more accountable governments, asking for less corruption. And they had monthly long protests in the major cities and major, major palaces and everywhere that you could have ever imagined. On 4th of June 1989, tanks rolled into one of the major protest sites. Hundreds or even thousands of people died on that night. We don't know the figure yet. But that was one of the most brutal crackdowns in China's history in terms of cracking down protests. So it triggered a lot of anxiety in Hong Kong community. There were also a lot of solidarity events in Hong Kong because they believed that the pursuit of freedom in mainland China was also their pursuit of freedom. So they had a lot of solidarity events, and eventually, when they witnessed the crackdown real time, they were also so frustrated. So after 1989, before 1997, there were a couple more waves of immigration. People left out of the fear of going back to the Chinese ruling. And that was the backdrop of um, the time when I came to Hong Kong. I came to Hong Kong in 19, 1999. And in the first decade, from 1999 to 2007, uh, from 1997 to 2007, it was considered a honeymoon period of the China-Hong Kong relationship. Um, in the first 10 years, the one country system seemed to work well. A lot of worries didn't materialize. Um, Hong Kong was still economically powerful. Our autonomous status was pretty much respected. Beijing didn't intervene our internal affairs as much as we thought it would be. So in the first 10 years, it was seen as a honeymoon period in between the people of Hong Kong and the government of China. Except one exception, it was in 2003, when the Chinese government wanted to roll out the uh, similar version of the national security law, which they would em implement it in 2020. I'll cover that later. They wanted to implement a law that would actively restrict Hong Kong people's political freedom. And that time, Hong Kong people stood up and said that they've had enough. They have one of the most massive protests in the history of Hong Kong. More than half a million people marched down to the street. And the government actually withdrew that proposal. They said that, look, we have listened to your demands. We withdraw that proposal. So it was one of the turmoil in this 10 years of honeymoon period but it doesn't really impact the relationship that much. So I would say that that was uh, already kind of like a healthy relationship at the beginning. And in 2008, uh, there was the peak of the relationship where there was a Beijing Olympic. Probably many of you 
don't, uh, cannot recall what, what, what was happening, but um, that was a big Beijing leap and that was the peak of Beijing soft power. Um, I was living in the public housing of Hong Kong, and it was quite packed, it was uh, quite cramped. We could really hear the cheering of, uh, of the people next door when the Chinese athletes got a medal and then climbing up the, the ladder of the, med, uh, of the medal ranking. And we were extremely proud of that. And that was the degree of the harmony that the Hong Kong, the Hong Kong people had with the Beijing government. And the statistics shows that. Um, in this stat, you could see the green line represents people who identify themselves as Hong Konger, um, and the blue line representing Chinese. So, roughly at the year of 2008, there was a peak of Hong Kong people identifying themselves as Hong Kong uh, as Chinese, and the lowest as Hong Konger. In academic time, it reflects to the approval rating of Hong Kong people to the Chinese government, and also the kind of national identity that, that, that they have. So it's also a demonstration of how well, actually, one country did some work in the first decades. Except the fact that after 2008, you can see a steep decline of Hong Kong people claiming themselves as Chinese, and a steep increase of Hong Kong people claiming themselves as Hong Kong. And that was pretty much the turning point of the relationship in between two places. As I said, there was a promise of Chinese people given to Hong Kong people where we would eventually get democracy. And when time goes, Hong Kong people would naturally ask, so you promised me, so when I can get my democracy? And there was the time when Hong Kong, that Hong, when Hong Kong people started to protest them. They started to demand more. They started to ask the Beijing government to honor their promises. And there was also the time when the Chinese government decided to adopt a more repressive approach to the civil society of China and a more aggressive approach in terms of positioning themselves in the world. So two things coincide. There were more intervention from the Chinese government. Hong Kong people were asking for democracy more and more. And the relationship started to get sour. By the time of everything that was happening, I was still a high school student. I didn't know much about it. As I said, I, my father was a construction worker. My mother was a street cleaner. They, they don't even speak English. They have ninth grade of education. They didn't, told, told, they didn't tell me anything about democracy, autonomy, or human rights. So I was kind of like innocent kid when this souring uh, period of time taking place. Um, I didn't know much about it. I didn't even think about being involved in politics or activism or going to protest. But it was not until there was a coming of age moment when I was in my high school. In 2011, um, I was still in my high school and I attended the very first candlelight vigil of the Tiananmen Massacre. Every year in Hong Kong, um, for the past three decades, except for the past few years because protests were banned in Hong Kong, every year there were candlelight vigil at one of the parks in Hong Kong commemorating the fallen in 1989 Tiananmen Massacre. And this is one of the most important events in the whole Canada of Hong Kong. People, hundreds of thousands of them, they light up a candle and to mourn the death and the fallen of the people who devoted themselves to democracy. For me, it was a shocking experience because when I saw all those documentaries, all those pictures, I saw people looking like me. I saw people having similar, similar age of me while they're chanting all those slogans strongly. And I couldn't help but wonder, what could I do in Hong Kong? And that was such a coming of age experience. And when you were situated in that scenario, when you chant a slogan, say like, end one party dictatorship, democracy, like you are empowered. It feels like you shoulder the responsibility of the fallen and also the responsibility of the people around you and also the city. So as an innocent kid who didn't know nothing about democracy and human rights, that was never in my dictionary, I started to pay attention to it. I started to feel like maybe I can contribute a little bit of it, maybe I can be involved. 
in the activism to achieve democracy. That was a life changing moment of me. And then fast forward when I'm in university in 2014, one of the largest civil disobedience <coughs> action taking place in Hong Kong. In September 2014, hundreds of thousands of Hong Kong people occupied the major runways of Hong Kong in demand of democracy because they've waited enough and Beijing refused to give Hong Kong democracy and then people felt like they have to act. And it was such a beautiful scene, but also abnormal, because for Hong Kong people, we are low abiding citizens, contrary to your perception. Um, civil, disobedience, civil disobedience actions means that you actively violate an unjust law to achieve justice. And that was never what Hong Kong people would do. In before, when we do protest, even we have hundreds of thousands of people rallying, we were really famous of, we don't leave a trash on the, on, on the road line. We, we, we pick them up. And then there were a lot of news saying that they don't see any broken glass in Hong Kong's rally. So we, we were described as the most polite protest crowds in the world. So that was Hong Kong people's education. Like they tried to obey the law. They tried to protest orderly. But this time it was different. Massive civil disobedience action prior to 2014 had never happened in Hong Kong's history. But it was also the time people saying that enough is enough. We've been demanding democracy for more than a decade. We want it to be implemented because we have every condition for that. We are ready for democracy and people's anger exploded. So in September 2014, there were massive occupations and people wanted a leading figure. They wanted a leader, and they chose the student organization, which I was part of it. Um, in 2014, I was 21. I was in my first year of university, and I was the head of my student union. I didn't know that I would end up in that position. In the first year, I think, just like every one of you, you were involved in one of the student society, you wanted to finish it in a year, so that you can fix your grades, you can have, like, learn some guitar, learn some foreign language, go to exchange, etc. Like, you felt like that was a pissed off of your life, and then you go back to your ordinary life, like graduate, get a good job, etc. That was also my thoughts. I was, it was my first year, I, I joined the student union, I thought that after that, I could go back to my school life. But the reality wasn't like that. I, I was plunged into the change of era. So um, in that time, because I was in that position, I was involved and I was seen as a student leader. I was involved in one of the negotiations with the government trying to figure how we can have a way out, how we can achieve democracy and justice. But at the end of the day, after 79 days of occupation, we ended up in failure. Our demand was not met, unlike in 2003. Beijing still being extremely heavy-handed. They refused to have any democratic process. And Hong Kong people um, was being waited out, and then the occupation ended. It was a big blow to the civil society because people were so united they were so brave to have a step forward in the history of protest in Hong Kong. They broke um, a lot of kind of orthodoxical understanding of it and then tried to pressure the government. But obviously the pressure was not enough. But for me that was that was the beginning of my activism. And after that I continued to campaign, I founded a political party, and I won the legislative council election. So I was once a parliament in, in a parliamentary in Hong Kong, and I was elected at the age of 23. It was the youngest ever elected uh, result. The, the the region that I campaigned, the constituency that I campaigned, was the most educated, was the most eldest, um, was the most wealthiest. It was pretty much a very prestigious place. All my prior um, legislators, they were 
they were like professors, they were retired government officials, they were like um, real the barristers. For a student like me who, was, who wasn't even graduated, who was a, just a student activist, student leader, having that victory was almost impossible. And in fact, before um, the election day, a month before that, I was pretty much rock bottom in um, all those pooling results. But I think, and I believe that uh, throughout hard work of campaigning, we managed to tell the world that we are not only able to try and protest slogan. We can also talk about policy. We can also talk about real politics. Not only I lack experience, um, but that also means that I could do things in a different way. I could do things in a way that is not intertwined with um, prior experience and, and in the interest network. And more importantly, people demanded a renewal of politics. They want youth power, they want youth politics. So I think um, lots of factors combined, um, I managed to get into the legislature and represent my people, becoming someone who can actually say I have the people's mandates with more than 50,000 votes. But um, as I said, after the first 10 years of the uh, one country, two system, the intervention from the Beijing government started to get more and more. And in the year of 2017, it, it, it even amounted to a degree that they would kick people out of the legislature. So for me and five others, legislators, under the reinterpretation of constitution issued by the Beijing government, which they skip the local legislation, they create new laws and apply it retrospectively. I got, I got unseated because of my um, own thinking section. And that was seen massively from the international legal community as a big intrusion of legal system in Hong Kong. And that was uh, one of the things that also made Hong Kong people really angry about because we were promised to have autonomy, but time and time again, Beijing to achieve its political goals, it basically in, intrude our, our system and to brutally commit this political persecution. Um, it was seen as a massive blow in the relationship of Hong Kong people and mainland China. And that was not the worst one. Um, later on, under the pressure of Beijing, under the pressure of the pro-Beijing mouthpiece, um, I went to jail uh, for my participation in the umbrella movement. And I was seen as first patch of political prisoner. On the one hand, it was really sad because it was the beginning of the massive erosion in Hong Kong's political culture, where you are in jail because of police protest, which in before, you will, you will get fined, you will get community service. But from my, from my case on, it would mean months of imprisonment. But on the other hand, I felt lucky, because if you look at people who are being charged with the same crime now, they're facing years of imprisonment. So the, the speed of deterioration of the system is much more rapid than we've ever imagined. And I lived through a lot of critical junctures of history. And then also, uh, my friend Joshua, who served jail for the same time with me, but for now he's also facing jail time in Hong Kong. I managed to get out, he couldn't. So he's now been in jail for more than three years, not knowing when he could get out, because the primary election case that I mentioned has never had a verdict. Trial is still ongoing, and pretty much how long he would receive jail sentencing is upon um, the arbitrary interpretation of the law from the judge and also Beijing. So it could be five years, it could be ten years, there's no sentencing guideline. It's about a political judgment by Beijing. Because of that, um, a lot of things happening. You can see that this is a graph about the people's confidence in one country, two system, which is the governing system of Hong Kong. You can see that um, from the year 2008, it steadily declined from around like 40 to 60 net value supporting that to 
um, approaching to the 2019 protest reach to the negative um, 30 percent. It was such a drastic change, and it was also a reflection of how much Hong Kong people were disappointed about the execution of Hong Kong Treaty System because at first it, it seemed well, Hong Kong people had expectation for that, but after all, when they have suffered from these different kinds of political blows, they started to lose faith on it. And then the 2019 protest taking place. The 2019 protest was a protest that is against um, a draft of the Hong Kong government that they are about to change their tradition. Uh, the draft is about allowing Hong Kong fugitive or defendants to be transferred and to be trialed in May in China, which it was seen as a very dangerous act because for all those Hong Kong people, we believe that there is a difference in two-place judicial system and they have much more faith in Hong Kong ones. If the government can extradite activists from Hong Kong to mainland China, that would be a dead end for Hong Kong civil society because we had a lot of um, activities are monitoring China's human rights record where they cannot do it in their home country where we have more or less a more open and more diverse political culture where there's none in mainland China where we still have certain criteria that could protect human rights defenders where there's none in mainland China we've seen a lot of tortures, we've seen a lot of disappearance of Chinese activists and we were so worried that the Hong Kong activists would be the next ones so under that fear, the 2019 became the largest protest ever taking place in Hong Kong's history. On 16th June 2019, there were more than 2 million people marched down to the streets. Remember, Hong Kong is a city with 7.5 million population. So we've got more than a quarter of the population marching down the streets, demanding the government to withdraw the law and also implement democracy. Contrary to the experience in 2003, the government says, we don't care. Just try to imagine if there, there was a more important population marching down in Leicester, in London, in the whole UK, what would happen? Politics would change drastically, right? Maybe the government would be gone, laws would be implemented. But not in Hong Kong, not in a place where you don't have any accountability to the government. So after a quarter of the population marched down the street, the government still says that. We are going to proceed. We are going to do whatever we think that would be good coin to Hong Kong. Not only that, they have also doubled down the suppression. Um, during the whole protest, it, it was monthly long. There were numerous tear gas pepper spray, rubber bullets, were fired to the protesters. And there were a lot of random attacks, a lot of uh, protesters being brutally assaulted. Um, and many of them, they were just trying to protest peacefully. Um, as you can see, there were um, a lot of occasions where you are in a very crowded tube stations and the police attacked indiscriminately. And many people suffer a lot of injuries, but they were too worried to go to hospital because whenever you get hit by a rubber bullet, you go to hospital, it means that you were involved in the protest. And you, the, the next thing you will face is an arrest. So a lot of them, even though they're injured, they're unable to go to the hospital. Um, and I'm not sure whether I can play this video. This is, a, this is a very disturbing video, but uh, what's more disturbing is the speed of this computer. <laughs> I guess it's, uh, it's still using Windows XP, right? Okay, um, so this is a very emotionally driven. It's, it's about a protesters getting shot. So if you don't want to see it, it's time for you to close your eyes. Um, <laughs> So um, it's very clear that um, 
there was one protester barehanded trying to walk to the police, and he just shot um, firearms to him. There was no what kind of threats. There was no weapon, but he at the end of the day shot that. So that was one of the examples of poli poli police mentalities that these protesters faced. And what's more disturbing is, up until now, we got zero case of investigation of police brutality. The police were acting with impunity. There were no accountability. And some of them, even, I remember, as the police who shot that protesters, they got medals. They were promoted for their efforts in suppressing the protest. So that was the reality of Hong Kong. The government act with impunity, police brutality would act with impunity, and there were no place of people to make the wrongs right. Not only that, there were also collaboration of the police government with the gangsters, where they rushed into also two stations and attacked by senders in this community. And um, there were also documentaries documenting these mobs attacking Hong Kong people are bystanders, a pregnant woman, journalist, and it's a terrible scene. It's one of the scars of Hong Kong people. So in, in, in monthly long protests, we've seen so many scenes like this. Um, we've seen young 13, 14 year old getting arrested just because they were in the protest. And that resulted to huge dissatisfaction of Hong Kong government. And when you see approaching to the 2019 protest, the dissatisfaction rate increased also drastically. You can see at the end of it, it was 80% of dissatisfaction rate to the Hong Kong government. It's staggering. In, in any metrics, in any scale, is staggering. You've got a population where 80% of your people are dissatisfied, dissatisfied with the government. And the government, in reality, they didn't have to do anything. They're not held accountable. But apart from all those miserable, tough facts of police brutality, we also see a lot of bright side of Hong Kong people. In the face of these adversity, Hong Kong people manage to have a lot of creative means to protest. For example, this is the Hong Kong way. It was, um, it, it took reference from the one in the Baltic states under the Soviet occupation, where the Baltic countries, they also had similar things, that they hold hands together to have a long human chain in order to express their hopes for, human, uh, for, for, for freedom and democracy. And we also have this massive land war, also learned from the uh, Tricofalia resistance movement, where people wrote their hopes and fear, their desire and despair, and then stick it to the war. It was a war of color, but it was also a war of protest. And also, in shopping mall, what are Hong Kong signature landmark? Like, people protest in shopping mall. Um, it, it is almost like, the most surreal place where people get an enchant slogan, but indeed, there were so many shopping mall protests. And when the frontline protesters, they, they had their improvised protection gear walk by, people cheered for them. It was a very empowering and moving moment. But of course, apart from all these things, we have stand still on the streets, where you see Protesters wearing helmets, they're wearing improvised uh, shields made by floating boats on the swimming pool. They have all these different protective gear just by um, buying stuff in this sports store. They are definitely not trained, not, they, they, they're not ready for that. But at the other end of the day, they were willing to face to well equip the police with impunity because of the love of Hong Kong and also to democracy. Of course, we 
We also work in a sort of violent protest. Petrol bombs were thrown from protesters to the police. There were a lot of bloodshed. But at the end of the day, if you try to imagine yourself, you know that no matter how much violence the police will use to you, they will never get any accountability. And you're risking pretty much your life going out to protest. For them, I believe it's quite naturally that you would use, use force to protect yourself. And that's the sad reality of protests and all these, all these conflicts. We all understand the root cause is the impunity of power. The root cause is that there's nothing to protect these protesters so that they have to use force. And I think if you or some of the others, they want to condemn violence. They also have to recognize that the only way to solve violence is to hold the power accountable. Otherwise, there is no legitimate grounds for us to do this condemnation. Even though for me as a nonviolent uh, practitioner, because I, I believe that nonviolent protest is best to have a moral appeal to the large public so that it could make our movement stronger, but it is also not in my position to say that they are extremely wrong because I also know that I also face a lot of police brutality. I also understand that facing off the police on the streets, how does it feel like? And it is almost logical for them to do that to protect themselves. And the 2019 protest lasted for six months. More than 20,000 people arrested. For now, we have more than 1,000 political prisoners because of that. A lot of people, they were just on site when the protest started, and they were seen, they were arrested. There were no footage or evidence of them showing violence. They are in jail for years. That is how arbitrary the Hong Kong legal system can be now, and being weaponized as Beijing's persecution tool. But nonetheless, Beijing still felt like it was not enough. So they introduced the national security law in 2020 June. And um, as I said, in 2023, there was a similar version of it being introduced. Back then, Hong Kong people protested, and they withdrew. But for now, it is also not the case. The Beijing government wrote out the national security law skipping the Hong Kong local legislation process, skipping the consultation process, and even the chief executive, the leader of the city, back then she said that she didn't know about the content of the draft before it was published. So a law that would drastically ch change the Hong Kong's landscape, by the time it was implemented, no one in Hong Kong knew that. The national security law pretty much is a very convenient um, legal tool to do political persecution. And as I said, many of my friends, including Joshua Wong and many others, they are being arrested um, because of their peaceful advocacy, and they are seen as endangering the Chinese national security, which the definition could be stretched over borders. And for me, exactly because of that, I had to leave. And it goes back to the beginning of my talk. I said a goodbye to my family, I boarded a plane, and I started the new life in the UK. And just after a few days that I left, my name was, was on the wanted list. I was wanted under the national security law, citing that my demands for democracy in Hong Kong, my demands for sanctioning officials that are responsible for this human rights violation is endangering the national security. So I became a wanted person. And that's the reason why I later on granted asylum in the UK. And for me, I, as I have gone through a very brief version of my personal history, I spent a lot of years fighting, the, fighting for democracy in Hong Kong and protesting with my fellows. It was particularly tough for me to be away from home. My role in the whole protest movement changed from a student leader to a politician, to, to 
a political prisoner, and now as an exile activist. Most of the time, all these changes, I didn't mean to do it. I didn't mean to be a student leader. I didn't really thought that I would go to jail because of protesting peacefully. And I definitely didn't, thought, didn't think that I would leave my hometown. I would leave the city that I devoted myself into it, that I served for the people and served jail for it. But I guess life is composed by an expected terms. Most of the things that happen to our lives, we didn't expect that. And it makes our lives more fulfilling, more fruitful. So after leaving Hong Kong, I managed to also change my position to be a much more international figure, doing a lot of international advocacy work, going to congressional hearings, helping to push bills that are about Hong Kong in both in the UK and in the US, and then also meeting gorgeous people like Maria Risa, um, and many others. And also being featured in a lot of um, awards and recognition. Um, I was one of the Times 100 Most Influential People in 2020. I was a person of the year of the Observer magazine. Um, I, I received my honorary doctoral degree last year, and I even was on Vogue. It's, it's interesting, it's like, that, that's one of the things my friend told me they are most jealous of. Uh, they, they, they had no other feelings of the other like recognitions, but that was particularly interesting for them, especially those who are not um, particularly enthusiastic about politics. Um, but it was it, it was me. It was um, a lot of unexpected turns, but I managed to find ways to best adapt different scenario. Um, and I really liked the quotes from uh, the first. Czech uh, Republic President Václav Havel. And he says that we never decided to become dissidents. We have been transformed into them without quite knowing how. Sometimes we have ended up in prison without precisely knowing how. We simply went ahead and did certain things that we felt we ought to do and that seemed to us decent to do. Nothing more, no less. And that's exactly what I've been through, and many Hong Kong people have been through. We were not particularly very political, but the broken promises, the intervention from the Beijing government, and the loss of freedom made us to believe that it's only by resisting and being involved in activism, things could change. In the future, I, I don't have much optimism about the situation of Hong Kong, because even though China's power is declining, but they are still really, really strong. They're still the most powerful authoritarian regime around the world. Its technological authoritarianism made the Orwellian state in 1984 an understatement. So they are still holding on to power. The political situation in Hong Kong is getting more and more dire. But I do believe that what we have done contains value, just like I was influenced by the people on the Tiananmen Square in 1989, on 4th of June. Just like many people still trying to light the candle to commemorate the fallen, to continue the movement. The 2014 Braille Movement, the 2019 Hong Kong protest, will definitely nurture and awaken and empower generations of Hong Kong people, or even people in the region. I've been to so many international conferences, and there were people from Thailand, from Myanmar, from Taiwan, and they came to me and said that they were so impressed by the movement that you have led. They were so enlightened by it that they have decided to be involved in the activism of democracy. So I believe that even though the situation in Hong Kong will be dire, but our efforts is not meaningless. So the path to freedom is tough and tumultuous. And the lesson we can learn from Hong Kong is that with an unchecked power, freedoms can be lost in such a glance. It's just a few months, a year of time. Decades of foundation of Hong Kong civil society were gone. Free media were 
forced to disband. Labour unions were forced to disband. Teachers unions, one of the longest ones, were forced to disband. And it teaches us a lesson, and I think that is really useful to you as well. Freedom, the price for freedom is eternal vigilance. The price of freedom is for you, not, a, not only as a beneficiary, but as a guardian of it, to act when you witness the threat of it. And I think it's, it's really important for every one of us, don't take it for granted. Don't take your democracy for granted. Don't take your freedom for granted. Even though you're disappointed to it, even though it somehow it has failed us. I can guarantee you it is much better than living in an autocratic state. So for me, it's a, it's a footnote of the democracy around the world, which it also, have, it also it needs your help to make it better, and also needs your help to make our democracy thriving and more representing. So for me, um, activism means that you dedicate part of your life into a collective group. You don't have to be a person like me who, who was elected as a parliamentarian and go to jail and then living in a foreign land. You don't have to do it. Maybe you're a graphic designer, you're an engineer, you're a social worker, but as long as you've got time, your spare time, to try to commit into the course, helping to design something, helping to build a website, helping to hand out a leaflet, that's part of activism. We don't have to make it into a difficult or a steep path that you've been through. I think it is really important because for us, most of the time, activism means that nine out of the time, ten times, you, you ended up failure because we are the power of people against um, the power of government or power of money, and we're always on the downside. So it really takes everyone's efforts to make a change into the society, in the society and how to shape it into the ideal that you are projecting. So I really do hope that uh, through today's um, stories of me and story of Hong Kong, uh, you can share the light of what Hong Kong has been through and, um, and the role of the Chinese government inside it. But also, I would also hope that more of you could be involved in the life of activism, fighting for democracy that you have, and try to preserve that. So if you want to learn more about it, you can also, this is an advertisement time. Uh, so you can also buy my book, um, Freedom, How We Lose It and How We Fight, um, uh, uh, How We Lose It and How We Fight Back. And um, it's been out for around two years. Um, next year, I was told that there will be a pink one paperback version. So you can either buy this one or save your money to buy it next year. Thank you so much. <laughs>